weirdness inside of me and I, I just a growing frustration and what Ashley said is so true you know Ashley's quick you know uh, you know I don't I got something to say and I'm gonna say it I'm a little bit more reserved and uh, but I could tell there was something bubbling up inside of me and if I didn't get a handle on it I'm gonna I'm gonna lose it and it's a frustration and I believe it's a divine frustration I don't believe it's a spirit I don't believe it's an evil frustration I believe it's God urging me thank you son uh, thank you son so much I believe that it's uh, so strong wow I believe that is a, is a divine frustration. God telling me, Brad, you got to get at it. You got to get into something. And when Jensen Franklin posted that, I said, I said, amen, that's what I need. That's what I want. And I need it. And, and I, let me tell you what I'm fasting. I, I've, I've, you've named the fast. I've done it. The Daniel fast. I've done the food fast. I've done it. I've done it all. And by the way, I think the Daniel fast is the worst fast. I think it's the worst fast. It's no enjoyment at all. I'd rather just not eat food than just constantly eat the same thing all day, every day. I've done a sugar fast. I've never done an ice cream fast. Look at my shirt. It's my first baseball shirt ever, and there's an ice cream is what it is. <laughs> Sitting in a Phillies cup. Yeah, man, yeah, I'm supporting both of my interests, Phillies and ice cream, you know. I got a nice one, though. I also ordered a nice one. But I, I told, I told God, I told Ashley, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to fast social media. And I, I have to use it for my job. We have to use it for the church. But Brad's sitting down and just scrolling through it. Because what I want to do is I really, I felt like I was telling this to someone at Men's Breakfast. I need a purge. You know, it's, ugh, it's get it out, ugh, get it out of my head. And I got a buddy I work out with at the gym. And he doesn't have Facebook or nothing. And he's clueless of what's going on in the world. And he's always just fine. I was telling him about that mask mandate coming on. And he's like, oh, I didn't even hear about it. So here he is walking around, you know, always smiling, everything's good. And I'm watching Facebook just depressed all day, you know. And I'm, I'm going to purge that. And so for the next 21 days, hopefully continuing on, I'm going to refocus and uh, get, more, get, get more God in me. That's what I want. That's what I want. Hey, Becca, put up my Bible verse today. Oh, so today is our Sunday fun day, which means 100% of our offerings today not your tithe but your offerings go to missions and we're and uh, if you were here last week you, you saw uh, Reuben come and when we give to Peru we give to Reuben and we give through Reuben and Reuben is going back to Peru hopefully in the, in the middle of August and uh, he came and he shared his story and basically what happens is is when we give to Peru we we give them the, the funding that they need for their feeding centers um, and then they basically say, hey, you want food? Accept Jesus as your Savior, you know, and we'll get you some food. And so they, they, they do that. And of course, that's more than that. Becca, put up, uh, I'm sorry, before you do that, put up that picture of the young, of the baby, of the young girl. Of the young girl. He shared this photo with us uh, last week. And uh, it was just a beautiful photo. Um, super sad that looks like it should be like in a national geographic like magazine that you'd find in school you know so this is the young lady and i forget her name uh sophia that sounds right and uh she looks like a sophia and they found her how old is that two under two found her in the rubble look in the trash looking for food looking for food in Peru and the, uh, the, the, the ministry that Reuben is a part of I'm sorry my contact all day is um, went and found her and of course got her and cleaned her up and fed her and now Becca go to the next photo this is her 18 years some odd later graduating from what high school or college with some you know incredible I mean that's what it when I saw that yesterday I'm a part of that I'm a, I'm a part of that. When I get to heaven, I believe that I'm going to be surrounded by people that I was a part of. And I believe she's going to be there. And I'm going to say, how, how are we? Well, you know, when you gave in that church there in South Omaha to Peru, that, that, that was for me. And that's what we did. And that's what we do. And I believe that when we go to heaven, we'll be surrounded by our, our friends and our family at the Divine Grace Orphanage. I believe that we're going to be surrounded by everybody who's in heaven today because of you. I believe she will be because of me. 
And, and Reuben sent me a text, and I won't read it, but he kind of gave some quotes uh, or some figures of how many people have found salvation through this ministry. And I think they're trying to raise something like $1,800 to go back and for these feeding centers. Becca, do we want to try to find that video? Sean, she's going to play this video. They, he made us a short little video. We'll try to play that real fast. Let's see if this works. This is the most nerve-wracking part of any church service. Will the video work? I mean, hey, I don't know if you the first part where he said, Brad Riddle and Heritage Church, and that's you. He's talking to you today. So they know about your support, and they know what we are doing today. Becca, give me that Bible verse again. I'm sorry. Give me that Bible verse. Right now, this is probably my favorite Bible verse. I kind of, you know, you stumbled on different Bible verses. This is one of my favorite ones right now. I like it. Why are you crying out at me? Tell the people, tell the people, get going. Why are you sitting there falling apart? Tell the people to get to work. Get moving. Um, in Exodus, we read about how the Israelites are freeing from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has a change of mind. And he says, why did we let them go? And so the Bible says that Pharaoh gathered his, you know, harnessed his chariots and set well over 600 chariots and, and his army and his men after the children of Israel to go capture them again to bring them back into bondage. And the Bible said that when the people of Israel saw them coming, they began to panic and they began to throw a fit and they began to cry out to God and they began to complain to Moses saying, why did you do it? Why did you drag us out of our slavery to bring us into the wilderness so that we could just sit here and die? They said we, it would be better off for us to be slaves in Egypt than to die out here and to be a corpse in the wilderness. And the Bible says at that time the Lord told Moses, he said, tell the people to stop crying out to me and stop whining. Tell them to get going. Tell them to move. Tell them to do something. I'm, he said, he said, pick up your staff, divide the waters, walk through the middle of the sea. I have taught you once. If I've taught you once, I've taught you a thousand times. Heaven responds to earth. God is an if-then God. If you do this, then I do this. And so God is telling the children of Israel, I'm not in your crying. I'm in your moving. So get moving. He said, raise your staff. He said, divide the waters and walk through. See all that? Raise, divide, walk. He said, you get moving. And when you get moving, I will move. Listen, in the book of Mark, it says, signs and wonders follow. Let me come on this side over here real fast. It says, signs and wonders follow. It doesn't say signs and waters begin. Signs and wonders follow. So when you get going and when you move and when you raise your staff, he said, then you will see the miracles of God. And let me tell you something this morning. If you're sitting there and your life is falling apart and you're crying to God, let me just repeat to you what the Lord told Moses. Stop sitting there and crying and do something. Get on the move and do something. Um, what? Listen, that we know. We know what the tithe is. The tithes opened up the floodgates of heaven and pours out a blessing you cannot contain. The tithe, which means 10%, unlocks the uncommon resources. If you need uncommon resources, stop crying about it. Do something about it. Get your tithe into the ground. The Bible says that seed, when it falls on good soil, returns 30, 60, 100 fold. If you want a hundred fold blessing, stop crying about it. Move. The Bible says we, when you give to missions, every time I pray, and I think, God for him sustaining heritage. God always reminds me, Brad, when you take care of my people, I take care of you. So stop sitting there crying about it. Move. 
do something about it. And so right now, whether you're watching on live, get up my, my tithe, put up my tithely image there, Becca. Whether you want to give right now in person or give through tithely, what you got to do is you got to move. You got to get that tithe sown. You got to get that offering sown. And your offering is missions. And I believe that my God is fertile soil. And I believe that when you give to him, the Bible says give and it will be given back to you. Press down, shake it together, overflowing. And I believe, I believe what my word says. So, my God, I pray that you will bless the gift and the giver. Whether they give now in person, they give through the tithe lamp, it doesn't matter. It is a seed. And God, I know what the Bible says. Stop crying about it. Do something about it. And right now, we're going to activate our faith. God, I pray that you will bless people and show them that when they are all about you, you will be all about them. Bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Some of you have given already. Some of you haven't. So get your seed in the ground. Come on, pray, seed. Play them happy a little bit. Come on, come on, come on. forever thank you so much praise team hey no really announcements for today but if you are a parent you've seen that monster slide outside and the kids right now are going to go out and they're going to play in it and you might hear some music and some kids out there running around that's okay that's okay and uh, we actually have that slide until two so don't feel like you got to rush off right afterwards if you want to hang out i won't be here till two i'm just saying if you wanted to be here till two i think mark and lower lee will be here till two i won't be uh but it's here I'm saying, I don't know why church has got to be boring. I don't know why. One of my best memories as a kid growing up in this church was when, I, I, I feel like I've shared this message before, but um, back there before it was kind of uh, uh, um, changed up. We had classrooms and and uh, our Sunday school teacher at that time had all, we had like a boys Sunday school class and, and we were making out of uh, uh, chicken wire and what is that? Uh, and then like, you know, the newspaper and the glue. What is that called? You know what I'm talking about. Yes, you guys are so smart. We are making paper mache uh, armor, armor. We are so proud of it. We loved it. And it never got finished. Our Sunday school teacher quit on us. And uh, that's kind of a sad story. But uh, what was that? You good? Oh, it's bumping outside? That's outside. No, they're, they're jamming, man. They're listening to um, Kurt Franklin. No, I, don't, I just, man, that's the first one came on my mind. I listen, I've got a good message today. I'm a little bit biased. Because uh, I'm the one that gets to preach it. But I hope to God that I can preach it, or at least not even preach it, if I could just convey it. If I, I, could, I feel like I've shared this concept or this finding out with a, with a couple people, and they're like, oh, yeah, cool, Brad. And I'm like, no, I, I kind of wanted your response to be different. You know, I, I was telling this to my dad. He's like, well, that's a, that's a good word, Brad. I'm like, dad, are you paying attention to me? I'm not going to call you for anything ever again. And, uh, but, it's, but it's good. I, I like it, and I, I hope you like it. And, and I'm sure I'm going to say this again, but just in case I forget to say it, because once I get going, um, there's no telling where I'm going. But just in case I forget to say it again, let me just tell you, I don't care where you're at in your life. Or what level you're on in your life. I promise you. Because I know the word of God. And I, I know what God is doing. I promise you. If you stay in the will of God. If you stay in the field of God. We're talking about Ruth and Boaz. If you stay there. I promise that you will become what you were created to become. 
And you're saying, but Brad, here's the thing, though. You know, uh, you don't know what I've done, and you don't know where I've been. And uh, Sean, they probably have to turn that down a little bit, though. <laughs> um, you guys, I don't know if you guys even pay attention to me. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, and I know, but no, Brad, you don't, you don't know. I've done some wild things. I've done some wild things. Maybe not as wild as you, but I believe I've got some stories that you'd be like, Brad, you did that. I did that. I, I've got some things that I'm not proud about as well. Um, I've been ashamed of myself before, but I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt, and I'm going to reiterate this multiple times, but I don't care again where you are or what you've done or what level you're at in life. If you remain in the will of God and answer the call of God, somehow, some way, you will become what you were created to become. I, we're in the book of Ruth, not really in the book of Ruth, but I've been using the book of Ruth as kind of a backdrop. Holy Spirit, let me preach this. We've been using the story of Ruth as, as, a, as a backdrop, kind of like delaying the foundation of the story. Because when you talk about levels and when you, and when you talk about I'm here but I want to go there, talk about development, talk about growth, talk about my setbacks using, using being used for my, uh, uh, my, my setups for my comebacks. When, when you talk about those stories, you can't really talk about that story and not talk about Ruth. And, and that's kind of where we've been, and I'll continue to kind of use that. But what happens is, is you get in the story of Ruth, and you get to a, a certain part in Ruth, and then we, you begin to kind of talk about the providence of God, um, the involvement of God. I believe, and maybe you don't believe, because I know some people that don't believe this, I believe that God is very much involved in every aspect of my life. I believe that God turns red lights red and green lights green. I believe that God orchestrates traffic jams to keep me out of harm's way. Now, some people don't believe that because they believe that God is so busy dealing with the crisis in the world that they can't worry about Brad. But you're just limiting to God. Maybe God is that busy, but my God is so big that he can be so busy and still be mindful about the needs of Brad here in little South Omaha. I believe that. But when you get into talk about Ruth, you kind of start talking about the providence of God, the, where God's involvement in your life. Let me tell you about Ruth. And I won't read it for the sake of time. And uh, my, my, my timer's already going down on me. Um, and it, it moved, it, it's crazy how fast that goes. And you look up and five minutes is gone and 10 minutes is gone. So the story of Ruth is simple. It's in, in a nutshell, what you have is you have Ruth and you have Naomi. At the beginning of the story, it was, an, it was an entire family. It was a husband and it was a wife and it was kids and it was, you know, daughter-in-laws. And now you're just down to two. You're down to Naomi and you're down to Ruth. Naomi's the mother-in-law. Her son has died, but Ruth has decided to stay with Naomi. Now, here's the thing. They have absolutely nothing. They have no money. They have no provisions. They have no security. They have nothing working in their favor. And Ruth says, I've got to do something. Why? Stop saying here crying. Move. I'm telling you, that right there is my favorite Bible verse. That's going to be up on my, on my phone soon. I like, I like to change the, the backdrops of my phones. And now it's going to be, stop crying, do something about it. And so Ruth said, I can't sit here and cry about it. I can't sit here and just, I got to go do something. So Ruth told Naomi, I'm going to go find a field. And I'm going to go back in the field, and I'm going to see what I can find. And she actually says, I'm going to go find a field, and hopefully... I can go find favor. Well, if you know the story of Boaz, she goes into uh, the, the, the story of Ruth and Boaz. She goes into a field and she just so happens to find that favor. And by the end of the story, she goes from level to level to level. And by the end of the story, she actually owns the field. And let me just kind of jump to the back end of the story. She actually participates in the, in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So she has absolutely nothing, and by the end of the story, she owns almost everything, and she's a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. But there's something that's fascinating that happens here, because it seems that Ruth really has no idea of what's going on. But she says this in Ruth chapter 2, verse 3. Becca, put up that Bible verse for me. She says this, and this is kind of interesting. She says, she says, uh, then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. She happened to come. She just so happened to come to the field belonging to Boaz. And, and again, everything works out because Boaz likes Ruth. They get married and you know the story. But she just so happened to go to that field. And I preached it last week. You know, when you have a relationship with God, there is no it just so happened. 
I believe that God is in everything. And I believe that God is even in the it just so happened moments of our life. But many people call it luck. We call it favor. We call it divine inspiration. We call it God is in the middle of my life. I was in a car accident over a year ago. And that was, you know, kind of a very big traumatic experience for me. And, I'm, of course, I'm fine. But it was a scary time. That one second, my life flashed before my eyes. And now I don't have a car. And I like that car. And i got to figure out. And it's just kind of funny how even in that moment, God kind of works things out because it just so happened that it wasn't my fault. And, and it just so happened that I found a nice car. And it just so happened that the insurance paid me more than what my old car was worth. And so you think, wow, man, you're, you're lucky. No, I'm not lucky. I'm favored. And there's a difference. I'm favored. It's not luck. God is in the just so happened moments. It, she, it seems that, that Ruth just, just randomly selected this field out of all the fields to go glean. And it just so happened to be the right field. And it just so happened to belong to the right person. And it just so happened, the Bible said that, that Boaz returned to see her in the field. It just so happened that Boaz showed up at the right time. I'm talking about the providence of God. I'm, I'm talking about God's involvement in your life. And I believe, and maybe you don't, but let me help you believe that I believe that God works through ordinary choices in my life. Things that most people wouldn't second guess. I believe in the little things. God is very much involved in just the ordinary livings of my life. The fact is, is I know that there are a lot of people that, that hear uh, uh, me or hear a preacher or hear uh, anywhere a message where the preacher or the teacher is talking about destiny and, and talking about purpose and talking about plans of God. And it can be very confusing because you're walking through things right now that are so traumatic right now. It is so chaotic. And you're, and you're saying, I hear what you're saying, Brad, talking about the plans of God and the purpose of God and the destiny, destiny of God. But right now, my life is so chaotic, I don't even know how you can put my life and what I'm going through and God has a plan in the same sentence. I think about you, Leanne. Some of you have so many stories right now that I don't even know. I, I hear you, Brad, and I want to believe that, but my life is so turned upside down, I don't know how in the same breath I can say my life is crazy, but God's involved. I don't see it. So it's a struggle, much less try to, in all this confusion and all this chaos, try to have this idea that there's somehow, somewhere, this unique, intricate plan of God is involved. How? How? I got a divorce. How? I've been betrayed. How? I've been backstabbed. How? I lost a loved one. How is God involved? I, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around this. And I'll be honest with you. This is a hard concept to wrap your head around because the Bible is full of God's foreknowledge. The Bible is full of God has this predestined thing that he's worked out with us. The Bible is full of all of these things that God is in the know and God is in charge and God is in control. But yet I, in my life it's such a mess and I constantly have to deal with this unscripted stuff. These things out of nowhere. I'm waking up and I'm finding terrors in my field. I don't know how they got there. I don't know who did it. You want to talk about God's in control and God knew this was going to happen. And he, caused the, and he called the end from the beginning. But I'm waking up almost every single day with these unknown things just popping up in my life. And now I'm stuck having to clean up something that was never my problem in the first place. So my life is very much unscripted, but you're saying that God is involved and God has already pre-planned everything. How? And about halfway through, when you finally kind of get your head straight, and, and now, now you, isn't, isn't it crazy how when you go through, when you go through a mess, how fast that ages you? Isn't that crazy? I've not been through a lot of messes, but I've been through one, and, and I look back and Facebook is from the devil <laughs> because Facebook has a, 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 a reminder of memories. And every year it reminds you of things. And, and, and it reminds you of, you know, back you know, eight years ago this happened. Thanks for reminding me, Facebook. You know what I mean? That was a traumatic experience. I remember that time. I remember. I remember when I posted that. And, and you look at pictures and you say, man, that, that, that really aged me. 
And so you go through these things and you're kind of kind of coming out of it a little bit. And now, you know, you're a little bit more aged. You have a little bit more wrinkles underneath your eyes, a little bit more gray in your hair. And you're sitting there and you're saying, how in the world can there be a plan intact? How, how, how? I'm just trying to survive. And that's where Ruth was. Ruth in that story, again, they have nothing, and they're just trying to survive. How can God be in this moment? How can there be a plan? I'm just doing all that I can just to, just to make it another day. You're, you're taking antidepressant pills at nighttime just so you can sleep. I know. I've been there. You want to talk about a plan? You know what? Brad, no. <laughs> Forget that plan. Forget that plan. If that's a plan, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I can't see how that is a plan. I'm just trying to cope. I'm not a smoker. I'm not a drinker. There was one time in my life that I was a smoker. And that was when I was going through that mess with Ashley. And for one year, I became a smoker. I smoked cigarettes. And I would smoke a pack a day. And my doctor said, who starts smoking at 30? I said, that guy that's going through a divorce at 30. Is like, you know, you want to talk about there's a plan intact? God, you want to talk about how you're on the throne? Ah, uh, yo, where are you? Because right now I feel like you're just throwing me out to the wind and I, hey, best of luck. Hopefully you land on your feet. But let me just jump ahead and tell you that there's, in the Bible, it says that somehow, some way, all things work together for those who are called. I'm, for all things work. Brad, your good and your bad. Somehow, some way, God uses them as leverage to set you up. And somehow, some way, God is able to take your good and your bad and make it all work out into your favor. I don't know how he does it. He just, he just does it. He just does it. You come in here and you hear me preach for half an hour about God's got a plan for you and all things work together for those. You hear me and you clap on the outside because you want to believe it. But deep down inside, man, you're just stirring and there's just turmoil because saying, I, I want to believe it. But man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I have to imagine that Ruth never, you know, as a young girl, never really envisioned herself growing up and, and going through the levels of life that which she's had to go through. I don't think Ruth grew up and as a young girl playing with dolls saying, I can't wait for me to grow up and marry a husband and have him die before we have kids. I can't imagine Ruth growing up and saying, I can't wait to grow up one day and to be poor and homeless and begging in a field. I can't wait playing with her dolls and envisioning her picking up leftovers. I, I can't imagine. Ruth, Ruth, listen, that was the hand that was dealt. Ruth had no control over the family she was born into. Ruth had no control of the, the faith and the religion she grew up to, the gods they worshipped. She had no idea that her husband was going to die. It was just what was kind of thrown into her lap. All of these were hands that she was dealt, and yet, somehow, some way. The Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. You know why? Because you need faith in order for you to respond to this message. Where I don't know how it worked, but somehow, some way, in the story of Ruth, we see that God is very much intricately involved in the good and in the bad. You know, and listen, let me just say that for a second because I, I feel like you need to understand this. I don't want you to be a place in your Christian faith where God, when things are going good, God is involved. And when things are going bad, God's forgot about you. Because I want to tell you that I believe that God is very much involved in the good and in the bad. And can I maybe propose to you that I see God more active in the seasons of my bad than in the seasons of my good? Can I tell you, at least in my life, that most of my teachable moments did not come out of my victories. They came out of my pain. They came out of my faults. They came out of my failures. They came out of this horrible experience. And so, again, Ruth is witnessing this. And maybe when she was in the middle of it, she did not know it. But now we're on the back end of the story. We read the story and we can see, hey, I just so happened. You didn't just so happen. It's the providence of God. 
That's how God is involved in your life at the level you're in right now. A lot of people say, I can't wait to get that, to that level, and I can't wait to get there. Oh, oh, if I could pray like Brad. Oh, oh, if I could speak in tongues like, like Tanya. Oh, if I could sing like Jesse. If I can get to that level, then God will be more active in my life. Ruth tells me that in the good when she's begging in the field, and in the, I mean, in the bad when she's begging in the field, and in the good when she's blessed and highly favored, God is in both in every single level of that life. Mm. John 1 verse 1, Beck. John 1 verse 1. Now, I got I to gotta be careful because I got to, hopefully, Lord, Holy Spirit, help me convey this. And you got to have to follow me because it gets kind of deep. In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word. Now, listen, you see how that word, word is spelled different, right? You see how it's a capital W? That, that needs to be a red flag. When you're reading your Bible, you need to see that and say, what's that about? Okay, so that's why, are you reading your Bibles? Yes, just lie to me. Yes. There we go. Read your Bibles. I, I talked to you guys a couple, of day, a couple of weeks ago that your Bible is made out of the same thing God is. The Spirit. The Bible said His Word is Spirit. God is Spirit. That Word, that Word is made out of, it has the same DNA. You want God in your life? Open it up and read it. You want God in your house? Open up your Bible and read it. Oh, we'll just go back on, stay on task. Amen. So in the beginning was the word. There's something unique about that word. That's a, couple to, that's a capital W. What's that about? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. What? Huh? In the beginning, in the beginning, before anything else happened, in the beginning was the word, capital W, and the word was with God, but the word was also God. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the, the word is Jesus. And so you can read that in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And hey, Jesus is even God. We believe in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three different divisions or dimensions of God, but they're all God. And so in the beginning, Jesus, even though we didn't see Jesus walk the earth until thousands of years later, but in the beginning, Jesus was there. Jesus, the, the Trinity, the, the, three, the, the, the three heads of God, the, he was there. So in the beginning, Jesus was, Jesus was there with God. He was the Word, and he was with God, and we continue to read him. And when I look at that word, Word, and this is where it kind of gets a little bit deep. When I look at that word, Word, in the Bible, <clears throat> Bible the Bible is written in uh, uh, Greek and Hebrews. I think Greek is the New Testament, Hebrew is the Old Testament. And when, when you look at the word Greek, I've been told before that English is one of the most difficult languages to learn because we have um, one word that has a lot of different meanings. And uh, I, I, bark, bark. Well, you're talking about a dog bark? You're talking about tree bark. What kind of bark are you talking about? Season. Well, like seasoning or the seasons outside, right? Um, bolt. Well, like a lightning bolt, he bolted, Usain bolt, Nelson bolt, what are you talking about? So it's kind of confusing. But with the Greek language, we were talking about this earlier today, Rick, the Greek language, they actually have a lot of different words for like the same word or the same meaning. For example, love. When we say love, love encompasses everything. Uh, uh, I love her. I love that food. I love my wife. You know, but we know that we know what that means, you know. Um, and so, so, but the Greek word for love, the Greek has like seven different words for love. I'm not gonna read them all, but you have like agape, you have uh, eros, where you get the word uh, erotic, uh, you have uh, pragma. They all they all mean love, but they all mean different dimensions of love, different ways of love. So when you read this Bible verse in John 1, 1, it says the word, the word oh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. We know that that word is Jesus. We know that the Bible says that Jesus is the word. But when you look at that word in the Greek, that word, follow me here, that word is defined as the whole concept. All right. God help me. It's the whole concept concept. So in the beginning was the whole concept and the whole concept was with God and the whole concept was 
God. Jesus is the Word of God. That word, that word, word in Greek, that word is logos or lagos. And that means the whole concept of God. So Jesus is the Word of God. He's the Logos of God. So in other words, Jesus is God's whole concept to us. Follow me. In John chapter 1, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, When you see me, you've seen the Father. How? Because I'm the whole concept. I'm everything. In the beginning was the whole concept. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was logos or logos. I am the whole concept of God. So when you see me, you see everything God wants you to know about him. When you experience Jesus, you experience everything God wants you to experience about him. You witness the whole concept. When you get saved and you invite Jesus into your heart, the whole concept of God, everything that he is, every dream, every hope, every aspiration, every thought, every dimension of God, the whole concept shows up in your life. Are you with me? I can't stop from smiling because to me this is incredible. It's the whole concept. Amen. My God, the whole concept. God is so good that God doesn't partial out little, bar little parts and pieces of himself and say, Marcellus, you've done good today. Here's a little bit of God. When you get saved, we get the whole thing of God, the whole concept of God. When you come in this place and the Spirit of God moves, the Holy Spirit moves in this place, what you're witnessing is the whole and the full concept of God moving in this small building. Amen. Amen. I don't I feel like maybe I'm the only one excited about this. Golly, the whole concept. And that happened way back in the beginning. We have to evolve and live through life for us to define who we really are in life. But God said, no, from the beginning. I know what I am, and I know what he is. And hell, oh, Brad, you're gonna preach. Stay there, Brad. Stay there. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2. Ah, this is good. The Bible says that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead. The fullness. He is the Father. Jesus is the Son. And Jesus is the Holy Spirit in one body. He is the full concept of God. You with me? So, so God, so God, God took the Father. God took the Son. God took the Holy Spirit. He emptied out heaven and he took the whole concept and he put him in Jesus and said, go walk around the earth for a little bit. I'll see you in 33 years. He put the whole full concept. He said, I am, Jesus said, I am the fullness of the Godhead. When you're walking and sleeping and eating with me, I want you to know that you're with all of us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy. I'm the full concept, the whole concept of God. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay. The Bible also says that we know that the Bible is the word. I'm, Ashley has her Bible right there. The Bible is the word. And Jesus is the word. So Jesus, the word, and the Bible, they, they, are, they are the same. The Bible is the whole concept of God. If you're not reading your Bible, you have got to start. And if you need to buy a Bible, I will buy you a heritage. I ain't Brad. Heritage will buy you a Bible. You have got to have a Bible. Why? Because that is the word of God. And what is the word of God? It's the whole concept of God. And so when you open up your Bible and you read one chapter, one paragraph, what you're doing is you're taking God and every, with every nugget that you're putting into your life, you're putting the word, you're putting the logos, you're putting the whole concept of God in your life. How in the world are you going to live and claim to be a Christian, a daughter of, a daughter of God, a, a son of the Father, and walk around the world or walk around in the earth with no, with my boy, Cameron, Colin Cooper, they're riddles. They have the fullness 
of bread. They have the fullness of Ashley inside of them. And so they know that. And when they live, Ashley, uh, they went out to the campground with, with Chuck, with, with Fampa, as Cooper calls him. Went out to, to the campground with Fampa and Fama. And, and they're out there. And, and Ashley took some pictures of the boys. And I was, uh, she sent them to me. And for a split second, when I saw a picture of Cameron, I said, I thought that was me. With his hat was backward, kind of a side angle. Man, that kid looked, in that photo, and we're always kind of fighting who the boys look like more. In that instance, he looked just like me. Why? Because he's the full concept of Brad. He's Brad. That's Brad. Ashley's always saying, he's you. You know, he's a lot to handle. And, you know, she's always saying that. He's you, you know. He's the full concept. You've got to open up your word, which is the full concept of God, and begin to, everything that God wants you to know about him is in that Bible. Everything he wants you to know about him is in that Bible. Everything he wants you to see is in that Bible. Everything he wants you to hear is in that Bible. Everything he wants you to read is in that Bible. He wants you to understand the full concept of God, and it's in that word, and it just so happened to be the Bible that, again, it's on your coffee table with a cute little bird on top of it for decorations. You're going to take the full concept of God and use it as decoration? Make your house look pretty? Meanwhile, inside of you, you look ugly? Take that Bible. Open up that Bible. Get the full concept of God inside of you. Ooh, I'll get off that one. Oh, boy. Boy. You ugly. You're a wretch. You're miserable. But your house is cute. Yeah. Yeah. Get, take, take, take that word. Ooh, how about my God? Take that word and just grab this word. My Bible doesn't leave my house. God, I don't want it to get ruined. Uh, fine. Open up this Bible. I don't know. Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Jesus traveled through all the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. Oh, my God. Tell me more about the good news. And he healed every kind of disease. What? Take the Bible. Take the fullness of God. The whole concept of God. And this is, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. My God, I don't know what it's even like to have compassion. I feel like everywhere I go, everybody's hating on me. This is the fullness of God. And I just want to look, make it look pretty. Is that cute? Do I need to angle it for like aesthetics? It's the fullness of God. So now we get a little bit deeper. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. So again, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. That word, Word in Greek is logos or logos. It's, it's spelled L-O-G-O-S. So you would say logos, but people pronounce it logos. And that is the whole concept of God. So Jesus is the whole concept of God. Jesus is the whole concept of God. Jesus, have I said it yet? Is the whole concept of God. Now we read Ephesians. Just as he chose us in him. Who's him? The body, no, just as he chose us in Christ. Just as he chose us in him, in Jesus. Just as he called us and pulled us out of Jesus. Before the foundations of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So we have been chosen. And not only have we been chosen, but the Bible says that we've been chosen in him. We've been chosen out of him. We've been chosen in Christ. We've been chosen. When were you chosen? When were you chosen? You didn't get chosen when you got saved. Well, when I got baptized, I think that's when I was chosen. No. He said you were chosen. When were you chosen? When were you chosen? Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. You were chosen before God ever said, let there be light. You want to act like you don't matter? You want to act like you're an afterthought that you have no life, no worthy, no worthy reason to live? Before God ever made the universe, he made you. My God. Amen. Come on. You're not as excited as I am. I look like a fool doing this by myself. Before he even made the, the foundation of the earth, he made this basic Brad. This ordinary Brad. Basic Brad. I have a friend at the gym walked in, and she's just all geared up for the gym, just looking like a million bucks, ready to lift every weight in that, in that gym. I walk, and I said, man, I said, you come in with an entrance. Got all the gear on. I said, I just come in like this. And she's like, basic Brad. <laughs> I was like, that's right. I just come in basic Brad. She comes in all geared up. You want to act like you don't have a purpose to your living? 
before God even sketched out the universe. My God, he sketched out your DNA. Before my God even said, you know what, I want that to be blue and I want that to green. He said, he said I want her to have blue eyes and I want him to have green eyes. Before he even thought about the mountains and the water, he said, I want her to be that size. I want him to be that tall. I want them to be born in that family. I digress. I don't, don't really know how to explain this. That's where the whole faith takes out. And maybe I'm, I'm not a scholar, so maybe if I dig a little bit deeper. But somehow, some way, back, back, back before the foundation of the earth, God calls a meeting with himself. He said, I, the, the, the topic of conversation today is uh, Brad Riddle. I've had him on my mind for a long time. And you know what? I'm kind of excited about him. And so can we talk about him a little bit? Can we map out his life a little bit? Can we start putting everything together? What do we want him to look like? What do, what do we want him to sound like? When do we want him to walk this earth? I don't really know how it happened. But somehow back before the foundation of the earth, God created me. He ordered my steps. And he gave me a purpose by which I am to live before he ever got started on the heavens and the earth. I'm just, just going through this earth, no rhyme or reason, no purpose. <laughs> no, that's a lie. That's a lie. You all have a purpose. Find out what that purpose is. Walk in that purpose. Before he said heavens, earth, let there be light, animals, plants, he put your life into play. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. Find out why you are existing today and walk in that field. Amen. Amen. All right. So stay with me. We're going to go deeper. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God. Word is Jesus. The Greek word for that word is what? Logos. And what does that mean? It's the whole concept of God. But then when you get to Ephesians, and it says that we are created and we are pulled out of Jesus. What is Jesus? He's Logos. He's the Word. He's the full concept of God. Okay? That word, chosen, is translated in Greek, eklegomai. Eklegomai. Eklegomai is the verb form of logos. So eklegomai is the whole concept put into action. Hang with me. Hang with me. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Jesus, and the word, or the word was with God, and the word is God. That word is Jesus. That word is Logos. It's the full concept. And so now he says, when I have chosen you out of Jesus, when I have chosen you in Jesus, what he's saying is, is he said, I'm going to put this Logos in action. Ek lego mai. I'm going I'm to, it's the whole concept put into action. So, so. The word, word, is the whole concept of God. And Jesus is the word. And so, and so Jesus is the whole concept of God. Now Ephesians says that we have been created in Jesus. And so now we have been created in the whole concept of God. I heard, I heard a cricket. I, I, I'm convinced. You weren't just randomly picked out of fairy dust. You didn't just come out of just, uh, oh, there we go. There's a Brad. That, that's not how you were created. He says the full concept of God is Jesus. And he said, I'm going to reach into Jesus. I'm going to reach into me, God. And I'm going to pull out Christina. I'm going to pull out Marcellus. And he says, I'm going to reach into myself, which I am the logos. I am the full concept. And I'm going to pull out of me, Brad. And because I pulled him out of me, Brad is part of the full concept of God. I don't care what level you're living out right now now. Your life is not a waste. You're not a mistake. You've not been forgotten about. You are a part of the full, whole, entire, complete concept of God. Somebody shout amen, please. My God. Oh my God. God said, I like him. I like this Brad guy. He said, I want one of these. And he said, I'm excited about him. And so he reaches into himself and he pulls out, out of the whole concept, Brad. Brad, Ruth is begging in the field. Her husband is dead. She's homeless with no food. But yet, Ruth is still a part of the whole concept of God. 
I'm locked up in jail. My family has deserted me. I'm bankrupt. I'm in a divorce. My health is falling apart. Uh, can I still tell you, you're still a part of the whole concept of God. The whole concept. Your good is the whole concept of God. Your bad is a part of the whole concept of God. I know that you have a body, but that body ain't you. That body, your mom and your dad are the ones who gave you that body, but that ain't you. That just holds the real you while you're on earth. But the real you came from God. God says you're the real you, that your body, that ain't you. Your body has deficiencies. Your body has holes. Your body has shortcomings. But not the real you that's inside of you. The real you is parts of me. I've chosen you out of the full concept of God. Don't look at your body. Don't look at your life. Understand that the real you inside of you is the real you. It's the full concept of God. It's not a mistake. It doesn't have deficiencies. You're not in the land of lack in the real you. You are already the full concept of God. You are already the full concept of God. You are already the full concept of God. Um... How? <laughs> because you see my life? You see my bank account? You see my crazy kids? My car is falling apart. I'm the full concept of God? I think he made a mistake. I, I, think, he, I think he was tired when he wrote this one. I think, I think he was too busy when he wrote my concept. Because my life doesn't look like this. <clears throat> God is not... God is, not, God is timeless. Um, we don't really understand that because we are not timeless. We have a past. We have a present. We have a future. We have an unknown. We have an unknown. And because of that, because you don't understand how God is timeless, when you pray, some of you pray like you're giving God information that he's unaware of. God, did you know that she said that? Did you know that that's happened to me? God, do you know about the coronavirus? And so you pray like you're giving God, you know, things that he doesn't know about. But in Ephesians chapter 3, it says that to God, everything is past. God doesn't grow. God doesn't increase. God doesn't learn. God doesn't get old. Not only is God not in time, but this will blow your mind. Time is in God. God does not exist in the time that we live in. The time is, exists in God. That's how God says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. He says, I'm the beginning and the end. He says, I'm the first and the last, all at the same time. He says, I don't experience what it is to be first and then go and see what it is to be last. He said, Simultane simultaneously is a hard word. I made it. He said, I'm all of that. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the middle. I'm all of that. I don't exist in time. Time exists in me. And so you've got to understand that to God, everything is finished. To God and in the spiritual realm, everything is done. Your unknown, your future, check this, is in God's past. God has already been in your future, and now God, it's in God's past. You don't know what tomorrow is going to be like, but God's already been in your tomorrow. Because to God, everything is past. I'm the Alpha and I'm the Omega. I can live anywhere I want to. And I know you don't know what's coming around the bend, but let me tell you that I've already been around the bend, and I know what's around the bend. That's why I think it's crazy that people don't have a relationship with God. He's the only thing, the only, the only deity, the only person, the only spirit. He's the only thing that's been in your future. He's the only one. No, he's the only one that knows what's going on. And I know that I don't know what my future holds, but I, I know who holds my future. When Jesus died on the cross, he went up. When Jesus died on the cross, he said on the cross, he said, he says, it is finished. He said it's finished, meaning everything that needs to be done, I've done it. I've, it's all done. And the Bible says he went up and he sat to the right hand of the Father, and that dude ain't leaving there. 
it's been finished. Everything that needs to be done is done. Everything that needs to happen has happened. Now, you may not have it in your physical life, but in this in the spiritual realm, I, I preached this a couple of weeks ago. The Bible said that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Well, where are they at? They're in the heavenly realms. We already have it. We just got to bring it to earth. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray, may your kingdom come. May your will be done. As it already is done. Just now let it come in my physical world. Sometimes you need to stop praying and start praising God as if it already happened. Because let me tell you, it's already happened. It may have not happened in your physical life yet. I squeaked a little bit. But it's happened in your spiritual life. That's why God told the Israelites, go and march around Jericho. And he didn't say, because when you do that, I will deliver into your hands. He didn't say that. that that's future tense. That's not how God talks. God talks in present perfect tense. He said, go march around Jericho. I have already delivered it into your hands. Well, the Israelites say, well, it's not in my hands. I know it's not there. In the spiritual realm, it's already been done. So what I need you to do is I need you to go over there and mark, uh, march around in circles until I deliver on what I've already delivered on. Until I deliver on the promise. I've already given it into your hands. So what you need to do is go march around the walls of Jericho until you see it come from the spiritual into the physical realm. I've already done it. Now you need to go do what you got to do to bring it into your life. Your prayer life, hey, listen, hear me this morning. Your prayer life is not you trying to somehow stimulate God out of his laziness. You're not trying to get God to do something he ain't done. What you're trying to do in your prayer life and what you're trying to do in your fasting and prayer is trying to get what God has already done to be done in your life. What God's already done to show up in your life. I believe that God is ahead of COVID-19. I believe that things are going to work out with COVID-19. I believe that our setbacks are set up for a comeback concerning COVID-19. I believe it's already been done. I believe that my, my increase and in my next level living is already available to me. And so when I pray, I'm not going to pray and say, God, are you aware of this? I'm going to pray and say, God, I know you've already been in my future. I know you've already worked things out. God, my prayer life is to get what you've already done to show up in my life. Amen. Amen. You've got to understand that in heaven, in the spiritual realm, everything that is to come already exists in a state of isness. It's already there. What are you? You're the whole concept of God. But Brad, I'm not. I'm not. Again, my life is crazy. I know. But you are the whole concept of God. You really are the whole concept of God. And what's happening is this. It's already been done. Back in the foundations of the earth, he said, I reached in. I reached into the full concept to everything I want this Brad to be. And I pulled him out. And Brad is, and you are a part of the full concept of God. I am the full concept of God in verb form. I'm living it out. I'm walking it out. I'm the full concept of God in action. And I know my life may not look like it right now because I am that way in the spiritual realm. I am that way in my spirit. So catch this. You know what you're doing every time you come to church? You know what you're doing every time you worship and pray? You know what you're doing every time you fast? You know what you're doing every time you open up your Bible? You are slowly becoming what you already are. The full concept of God. I don't care what level you're on. I don't care what your today looks like. You are the full concept of God. You are everything. Everything that God wants you to become, you will become that. So what do we do? What do we do? You are like Ruth. You go get yourself in a field. You go find the will of God. And you say, you know what? I'm just going to so happen to go find the right field. You get in the field and you get to work and you work in that field. Let me tell you this, and this will be my close. God, help me, help me say, I said it earlier today when I was preaching to myself. Yeah, how did I say it? 
you hear this message and you hear like, okay, yeah, 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 the full concept of God. Yes. So now all I have to do is just wait for it to happen. Uh, th this message is real and this message is true when you're a child of God. In the story with Ruth and Boaz, Boaz is 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 a uh, is a is um is like Christ. He, he he's a oh, I can't think of the word. He represents Christ. So when you read the story of Boaz and Ruth, you know Boaz is Christ-like. You know you there's a lot of correlation there. And so Ruth finds favor, and she goes level to level to level, and she slowly becomes what she already is, not a widower. Not, not a beggar. She becomes what she is supposed to become while she is in the field belonging to Boaz. While she is in the field belonging to Jesus. While she is in the will of God. And Boaz says something. Boaz says, hey, Ruth, listen, don't go to that field. Don't go with those people. I'm not in those people. That's not me. That's not the will. Listen to me, Ruth. If you want to find favor,